Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. Welcome to the broadcast. We're very honored and flattered today to have Dr. Mesh Seibel from Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. He is a specialist on women's health, particularly menopause, and he has had a lot to do with ME because so many women are affected. Is that not correct, doctor? And tell me, how did you get into it rather than I telling you? Uh, how did I get into the women's health arena or into Well, the... both, really, and into the myalgic encephalomyelitis. Well, in terms of the uh, women's health part of it, I began my career uh, as a infertility specialist. I had an opportunity to do some of the first in vitro fertilizations in the country, and uh, it was a very exciting time. But a number of years into that, my wife had surgery that threw her into early menopause. And when that happened, it was only months after the Women's Health Initiative or the WHI study came out, saying or suggesting, I might say incorrectly, that estrogen caused breast cancer and other problems. So there she was, a young woman with her ovaries removed in need of hormone therapy, and the practitioners were concerned about giving it to her. So I basically transitioned. As I say, I used to do sperm to term, and now I do womb to tomb. And so I transitioned into menopause so that I could be of assistance to her. In terms of the uh, ME and CFS, the, the reality is, is that the symptoms, the demographics, and the issues that women in that condition face are so overlapping with that of those of menopause, that's inevitable that you're going to have a subset of patients that are going to uh, end up having maybe both menopause and uh, the chronic fatigue syndrome, but some of them will just have the one. And so it just happens that the a group of women who I have the privilege to serve come in that demographic. Now, when we talk about women's health and ME, as we use that shorthand, uh, there is some unhappiness, largely because uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who we all now know from being the lead on COVID-19, put women's put uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, as it was then called, under the Women's Health Vertical at National Institutes of Health. And this was interpreted by some patients, not all of them, but by some patients and their advocates as a demotion of seriousness mm. because they read it that what Dr. Fauci was doing was saying, oh, it's women's health, these are hysterical women. I, I do not, by the way, subscribe to that view at all. Um, do you, find any of that? Have you found any resistance to your specialty as applied to MECFS? Well, realize that I am dealing not only with uh, MECFS, I'm also dealing with menopause. And to date, I haven't found many women who were excited about pronouncing that they were in menopause. And so we're dealing with issues that challenge women. And because women face a glass ceiling, or at least challenges, particularly in the workplace, but in general in society, uh, they are not keen to be labeled with things deemed to be hysterical or psychosomatic, which neither menopause nor MECFS are. They are both bona fide uh, clinical entities deserving of our attention and actually trying to help them avert some of the symptoms they're having to face. And I can appreciate why they may feel that way. But I think the fact that women are overrepresented in that condition is the reason that Dr. Fauci chose to put it under women's health because about three to one, it's going to be women to men. And because of that, it's easier to try and appropriate funding and appropriate research and so forth in a direction that has a, a header that fits more specifically. Let me just run back to what you just said. 
um, three to one, did you say? Because the most grievously ill people I have seen with MECFS, I mean, absolutely bedridden and incapable of functioning, in some cases, incapable of touch, intolerant to sound, intolerant of light, et cetera, uh, have been men. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether it's merely a, a function of the reporting that men have been more reluctant to uh, uh, to identify with the disease and uh, fear the stigma of being told they were lazy or incompetent or the many things that people are told when they cannot function, but there are no visible outward symbols and you can't get a biological test. You can't just go to your local doctor Correct. and then get a note saying, I have MECFS. Um, it's a big problem in both the, both reporting it and finding somebody who can give you a diagnosis. Well, there are many conditions in medicine where people run around from doctor to doctor trying to get a diagnosis for whatever it is that ails them. Mm -hmm. And we are privileged to have such great subspecialists in this country that we have the capacity to deal with most anything. The problem is you've got to find the right silo to walk into in order to get that treatment. And so there is the downside of subspecialty allowing many people to suffer for a long time because the people who they've seen thus far don't happen to have an expertise or an awareness. And you know, as they say, you know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So it's just a problem of the circumstances that we work under. I can imagine that men are in no hurry to be labeled as less than macho or, or strong and powerful. And so I can appreciate that men would perhaps not want to fess up. But if they are affected sufficiently, I think, by this disease, I do believe that it behooves anyone who's so fatigued and so uh, disabled uh, in so many ways that they seek help and Hopefully they have it right with the women versus men, but I can't answer that question with certainty. How do you settle on a diagnosis that you have a patient who has a menopausal problem, but also has an ME problem? Uh, is that just from long experience or do you go through the usual tests, which are not that plentiful exercise, that sort of test? Well, of course, as you know, as you've been interested in this and interviewing people about it for a long time, there are specific criteria for MECFS. And of course, it's the, the inability to do what you were doing six months earlier and the uh, having the... That, that might also, I might say, be the criteria for age. Yes. Well, you know, that is, a, that is, I want to come back to answer your question, but before I do, I wanted to say that one of the problems uh, with you know, infiltrative heart diseases, uh, with conditions like uh, MACFS, like uh, even a low thyroid, when, when something happens and it happens to someone that's you know, over 50, certainly over 60 and definitely over 70, age all suddenly becomes the, the fallback, well, it must be age, you know, you're not as young as you used to be. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is true. You're never as young as you were two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that you walk in life in a very general trajectory. Things, you know, as I have a sign in my office that says, uh, congratulations, things are getting worse at a slower rate. And so you, things are steadily on a decline. But if you fall off somehow into a hole, then something has happened, even if you are at a, of a certain age. But the point of it is, is that in order to make this particular diagnosis, uh, we said it was something that had to do with not being able to do what you could do six months ago and really being less able, uh, having this post-exertional -exertion, uh, malaise where you do some exertion, and that exertion could just be taking a shower, or it could be just having to really think very hard about a certain circumstance or condition. And then, not necessarily immediately, but in minutes, hours, or days, suddenly you are just had, someone just took the plug and unplugged you. And then finally, this condition of 
sleep, but not rested. You just wake up tired all the time. And then you have to have one or the other, either some orthostatic problem where you have lightheadedness or you have this cognitive issue. So, you know, more than 50% of the time you have a significant cognitive uh, decline. So what happens is now you've got this group of women. You have women in menopause. They're going to have brain fog. They're going to have mood swings. They're going to have irregular bleeding. They're going to have problems with sleep. They're going to have a, a whole bladder issue, sensitive bladder. They're going to have irritable bowel. All these things are uh, appropriately assigned to women in the perimenopause or the period leading up to menopause and menopause range, but they are specifically also identified with uh, MECFS. And so menopause can be diagnosed by specific blood tests and by a variety of things that we can do, whereas MECFS you really have to diagnose uh, or attempt to diagnose everything else. And that might be uh, viral syndromes, that might be mono, that might be uh, fibromyalgia, it could be uh, Lyme disease, it could be, you know, there's uh, dozens of diseases. And when you get nothing in all of that workup and the symptoms are there, then you have to assume it's the MECFS. It's more one of exclusion. You took a word out of my lexicon when you said silo. And one of the things I've looked at is siloing, not only in medicine, where I think it's fairly severe, but where in many other things, including engineering, uh, computer science, uh, people tend to project one aspect of knowledge onto everything, a kind of one factor analysis. And the complaint I hear about doctors is that they wish. Uh, their solution on your problem, and their solution, their specialty may not fit your problem, which might be quite otherwise. And that's often the case with MECFS, uh, where it's very difficult to diagnose, as you know, there's, there's no marker, there's no bodily fluid marker that you can push through a machine and say you've got it. Um, uh, what do you think the problem of siloing looks like from your point of view? The more specialization we have, the more specialization we get. And right. sometimes you just wonder what happened to the old fashioned doctor who knew a lot of things, or for that matter, the old fashioned farmer who could uh, fix the tractor, taste the pH in the soil with his tongue and didn't need a specialist to fix the tractor and specialist to check the pH of his soil. Uh, do you see that as a problem in medicine going forward? I see it as a, it's sort of a, a benefit and a risk because on the one hand, as you know, the system works well for about 80% of the people who fall into a, a, a decision tree where you have a paradigm. If they come in, you do this. And if it's that, you go this way. And if it's this, you go that way. And, and you can keep going down that decision tree and 80% of the time you're going to be right. In many conditions, maybe it's 90% of the time. I mean, uh, I myself had a condition a, a, a year ago, was finally diagnosed a year and a half ago. Uh, it took three years and 16 doctors for me to get diagnosed, going to some of the best in the country. And uh, it was incredibly frustrating, and I feel pretty confident if I hadn't been persistent and said, listen, I mean, I've been do I know myself really well. There's something wrong here. And if I hadn't kept going, I would never have got to the end of it. The condition would have got to me before I got to it. So it's both a good and a bad, and it doesn't limit itself to patients. No, it doesn't. You find it in all aspects of society as well as all aspects of medicine. Going forward, these, they're called orphan diseases. They're just the diseases that don't get a lot of attention because cancer and heart disease and arthritis and diabetes uh, demand the public attention. What is the future for research in these diseases? I'm thinking of MECFS in particular, but going forward, what is the, what is the future of the research? Are we going to get the talent? 
repellent into these lesser diseases or these less prevalent diseases that are still horrendous? I think the answer is yes, but I think it will be a slow walk. And I think the reason is it will be slow is because until it affects the person who can fund it, it doesn't get funded nearly at the depth that it should. But once it does that, you suddenly find immense interest. And it's amazing what people can do when they decide to assemble a team or a task force to go forward, assuming you give them the free reign to do what needs to be done. I would like to say, though, that the ME-CFS is interesting in that, in the, from the viewpoint of women's health. And could I take a moment and just talk about that? Please. The reason I think it's interesting is because now we know that menopause happens, for instance, in an age range from about 45 to 55. The mean age is about 51 in the United States. And so if I were to ask a woman, you know, how old are you when you go into menopause? Are you in your 60s? Are you in your 50s? Are you in your 40s? Are you in your 30s? Some will pick any of those. Most will pick older than younger. But the truth of the matter is all of those are accurate because about 5 to 10 percent of women go into menopause, what's called early menopause, before age 45 and one in a hundred will go into menopause before age 40. Now, what makes this interesting is because now we know that MECFS has been associated with early menopause. And so because of this association, uh, it's quite intriguing that uh, many of those women who are coming in with the symptoms we talked about earlier, the sensitive bladder, the poor sleep, and maybe now the hot flash is also because they have been there in early menopause uh, or entering into it. All of the things we associate are now actually associated with the ME-CFS. And it turns out that women in this younger group tend to have uh, more menstrual bleeding. They have more menstrual pain not associated with their period they end up having many more hysterectomies. Uh, they have uh, 12 times the, the pain conditions of uh, you know, pelvic pain. They have uh, increased gynecologic surgery, increased hysterectomies. Uh, many times the hysterectomies precede, and the hysterectomy is, of course, technically removal of the uterus, but just taking out the uterus and not the ovary still leads to earlier menopause because of compromised blood supply. So they have a tendency to, to have these surgeries seven out of 10 times before the MECFS goes into place. And so uh, whether or not it's a chicken or an egg, I don't know. But we do know that there is this association between all of these women's health issues. Uh, they have more tendency to have endometriosis. They have more tendency to have interstitial cystitis and infiltrated bladder disease, more tendency to have polycystic ovaries, more tendency to have irritable bowel. All of these conditions, very common in women, uh, if you look at them as a composite, they might all be trying to direct you to a new diagnosis and not just the menopause itself. And the thing that is important that I want to underscore here is because early menopause is a different condition than uh, menopause that happens at a more natural time at a later age. Because the earlier the menopause happens, particularly under 45, definitely under 40, perhaps even as late as age 48, without treating with hormones, actually sets the woman up for more health issues, such as uh, mood disorders and psychiatric disease, suicidal tendencies, Parkinson's disease, osteoporosis, heart disease, and a whole lot more that can be mitigated with hormone therapy if, they're, you know, if it's appropriate for them. And so the reason I'm just talking about this is because even if they have uh, MACFS, they still ought to be thinking about treating this menopause if they're in it early, which is highly overrepresented in these women. Do you think that with this disease, we're going to see a eureka moment when somebody rushes out of the laboratory and says, I've got it, I've got it, 
or do you think it's going to be a slog? The pursuit of a therapy to give some relief and some hope to these people who to me seem to be under glass for life, looking like us, being like us, but separate because they have no energy, no ability to participate in life the way that those of us who are not afflicted do. Right. Well, whether it'll be a mold on a, on a Petri dish that told Alexander Fleming, you know, this could be mm -hmm. you know, penicillin, whether it'll be that kind of an opportunity, I don't know. We have such uh, new advances now in, in molecular biology. Uh, we have such a new insights into how receptors work at a cellular and molecular level, because there seems to be something off on the uh, estrogen receptors in this group of patients. And also there seems to be something off on the thyroid. The thyroid, uh, low thyroid is another condition that's often confused with the fatigue circumstances. And the, they tend to have the low thyroid levels like T3 and T4, but at the same time, usually when those hormones are down, then the pituitary hormone, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, goes up to try and make the thyroid produce more of these uh, T3 and T4. But that doesn't happen. T TSH is normal and T3 and T4 are low. So the normal uh, uh, ways that these things uh, interact, the thermostat is broken in some way in this, whether it's receptors or functionality, I don't know. So there may be a moment when all of a sudden these pieces fall down and the puzzle suddenly assembles itself, but we're not quite there yet. Do you think that we'll have, you know, we've got a war going on, a war against COVID-19, and during wars there are a lot of spin-offs, a lot of technolo technological advances, et cetera. Do you think in medicine we're going to see a lot of developments for therapies or even for immunization come out of uh, this struggle to find a cure or at least a therapy for COVID-19? Well, I think it's inevitable because, you know, we're in a situation with we're trying to make a vaccine for a disease or a virus for which was just, it's novel, it hasn't been known before. So we don't know exactly how to go about that. And then in just experiments that have taken place with relation to COVID, uh, there's, uh, in humans, they have found that the cells from the uh, mucosa, the nasal mucosa, when they're cultured together with estrogen, they find they're more resistant to the COVID than if they are not. And this is, was looked into because we know that uh, women tend to be less uh, afflicted by COVID uh, slightly than men. And then in mouse models, they have found if they in, if give really lethal injections of COVID into male mice, it will kill them. If they give it to females that are still able to reproduce, it doesn't. If they take the ovaries of the mice out and give it to them, it will kill them. If they take the ovaries out and then replace estrogen, it protects them again. So there's something going on with hormones, and they think that might be having to do with estrogen receptors and how they work. There's a lot of science that will come out of COVID, a lot of hardship and heartache, but some good things will come out of it. And all we can do is uh, wait to see. I, I find this very interesting. I've interviewed quite a number of women who were pregnant with MECFS, and during their pregnancy, they had none of the symptoms. The moment they gave birth, all of the symptoms returned. So their happy time was that nine months when they were expecting. Does that sound as something that you would appreciate or understand? Or is that to do with hormones or to do with what? I would have to say it's due to hormones. I mean, the, the levels of estrogen and progesterone are just super physiologic. You don't get those levels at any other time in your life as a woman. And so... Uh, I would assume that's true. And there are other medical conditions. Lupus often, systemic lupus will often get better during pregnancy. Uh, those are moments of reprieve for some women. There are a number of uh, conditions like that. And uh, it's interesting that women with ME uh, CFS get more pregnancies than women who, are, uh, who don't have it. 
Now, I don't know if it's more miscarriages or not, but I know they get pregnant more times, and yet they have less years in general because they are getting into menopause earlier, generally speaking. So it's kind of interesting. There is a lot going on in the reproductive uh, organs that are affected, and there's just a lot we don't know. Doctor, where do people who want to talk to you find you? At Beth Israel, Boston? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, go ahead. Sorry, you also have some kind of publication you do with your wife on menopause? Oh, yes. Well, I have a, I have a website that's uh, Dr. Mache, D-R-M-A-C-H-E dot com. And, and also together we do a magazine. It's called The Hot Years. Uh, and it is uh, a lovely magazine, award-winning magazine for women in uh, midlife. And basically, it helps midlife women to, uh, to feel better and to uh, try to get some control over their life and their work and their relationships. And if, if I'm allowed, I will, I will well, mention... Please, please, I asked you to bring it, please. I have uh, this book that's been endorsed by the North American Menopause Society, uh, it's, it's been a very helpful. I get a lot of letters from it's women. It's called The Estrogen Fix. Yes, The Estrogen Fix. And the reason it's good is because it demystifies hormones and it tells you how to take them safely, when to take them, and it gives you alternatives as well. And in the last chapter, it tells you how to talk with your doctor about this, which I think is a challenging thing because I think most of us, when we go to the doctor, the things that really worry us are the things we put off until the last moment. And just as the doctor is reaching for the doorknob, the big questions come. And so it gives you tips on how to uh, approach these visits so that you know how to better get the information that you're looking for. Mesh, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on the broadcast. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm so grateful for you including me. Thank you. Our pleasure.